Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Heavenly Father and from His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born especially for you. Amen. The text for us to ponder this special day is the Old Testament reading they heard a few moments ago, but especially these words from this text. Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time I will return to you about this time next year. And Sarah will have a son. This is the word of God. Today I'm going to do something kind of risky. I'm going to be open with you. I'm going to tell you about a mistaken judgment I had last year. Now, you may have heard that last summer after our congregation and Lutheran Indian Ministries had put on our fifth annual teen Bible camp up in Alaska, that Lutheran Indian Ministries decided that they were no longer going to be doing any sort of short-term mission efforts in Alaska. And that meant they were no longer going to co-sponsor the teen Bible camp with St. John's. Now, I have to tell you, that was devastating news to us. We had been building up and developing that teen Bible camp for five years, and we were really excited about what it was turning into, and about all the teens we were able to help grow in their faith. And that year, we had a record 12 teens uh, that were baptized at camp. And we were totally looking forward to what God was going to be doing in the years ahead in that Bible camp. But now, Lutheran Indian Ministries was pulling out of our partnership. And you need to understand, Lutheran Indian Ministries was the main financial partner in that venture. Now, we provided most of the volunteers. We kind of did the programming, came up with the plan for what we were going to do. Um, but they paid most of the bills. Especially, they paid for the expenses of flying all those teens into Fairbanks. And that's a pretty hefty amount. And when I heard the news that they were not going to continue with this partnership we had, well, that's when I had a serious mistake and judgment. For in my heart, I immediately began to assume that we would no longer be able to have teen Bible camp in the future. In my thoughts, it was over. It was done. I mean, what could we do? That's the mistake I made. You see, I made the mistake of thinking that God was not up to that challenge. I made the, mistaking, made the mistake of thinking that this was too big a problem for God to be able to take care of. You see, I made God way too small. You see, the God I was believing right then was not the triune God of the Bible, the God who could create all that exists in six days, the God who could raise the dead and calm the storm and heal the sick and give sight to the blind and so much more. No, the God I was worshiping at that moment could not do any of those things. See, I made God way too small. I did not think God would be able to raise enough money so that teen Bible camp could continue. Now, as you probably guessed, if you knew what I was doing last month in uh, Alaska, that I was totally wrong. For God opened up hearts and wallets and purses and checkbooks all over North Carolina and all over the United States, and in the end, we raised enough money to pay for all the teen Bible camp expenses this year. In fact, we raised a little more money than we actually spent and already now have the start of saving up for Teen Bible Camp 2020. So God was, in fact, able to handle that problem that I thought was too big for him. He had no problem at all providing the funds that we needed for a Teen Bible Camp to continue. God was a whole lot bigger and stronger than I had believed. He was able and he provided. You see, that's the kind of awesome God we have. Well, in her text, Sarah made the same sort of mistake that I did. For in her thinking, in her thoughts, she made God way too small too. 
A little background, though. When God called Abraham to leave his family and his home country and travel to a land he would show him, God specifically promised that Abraham would have an offspring with Sarah. And through that offspring, Abraham would become the father of many nations. And that through one of his future descendants, all the world would be blessed. And when Abraham and Sarah heard these beautiful promises of God, they believed them. And they rejoiced in the goodness of God. Now, this promise was made when Abraham was already 75 years old, but still, with God being their God, they believed he could keep that promise. But then nothing happened. For year after year, nothing happened. For decade after decade, nothing happened at all. Sarah did not become pregnant. They did not have a child. Nothing happened at all. Now, during those long years of waiting, it happened that Abraham and Sarah began to give up on God to keep his promise. They thought God was not going to be able to keep his promise and provide them with a son. So then they took matters into their own hands and had Abraham sleep with one of Sarah's servant girls. And so Abraham, when he was 86 years old, had a son, but not a son with Sarah. And God made it clear that this was not the child of the promise. So they still needed to wait for God to keep his promise. And for 13 more years, Abraham and Sarah waited. They continued waiting and waiting and waiting, and nothing happened. Until we reach our text, when Abraham is 99 years old and Sarah was nearly that old, Sarah's body was now way past the age of childbearing. She had gone through menopause, and Abraham's body had aged too. They certainly could not imagine that they would ever be able to have a son together. And that's when the three special visitors in our text came to visit Abraham and Sarah. Now, our text makes it clear that two of these special visitors were angels, but it also makes it clear that one of those special visitors was the Lord himself, the pre-incarnate Son of God. One of those three special visitors was our Savior Jesus. And when Jesus spoke to Abraham, he had good news for him. For in less than a year, Sarah would give birth to a son. God was going to keep his promise. Now, this conversation was taking place just outside of Sarah's and Abraham's tent. And Sarah was just inside the tent listening. And when Sarah heard that she was going to have a son in less than a year, well, she couldn't help herself. It just kind of automatically happened. And she laughed. <laughs> She laughed because that's funny. I mean, she couldn't have a child. She had gone through the change. She was no longer able to have a child. What the stranger thought was impossible. That's what Sarah thought. Same thoughts would have gone through our head as well. I mean, there's no way Sarah could ever have a child now. No way at all. Or was there? Maybe Sarah made God way too small. Maybe God was much bigger than she realized. And indeed, God was much bigger than Sarah or Abraham or we ever could have imagined. He's a whole lot bigger than we want to give him credit for. My friends, our God is able. And that's just what we see in our text for today. As God spoke through this text, why did Sarah laugh and say, shall I indeed bear a child now that I'm old? Why'd she laugh? Is anything too hard for the Lord? And with those words, God reminded Abraham and Sarah and all of us that nothing is impossible for him, that nothing is too difficult, too hard for him. In our text, God reminded them and us that he is God Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. He's the Almighty God, the God that can do anything he wants to, that is in keeping with his character. He can create the universe instantly out of nothing. He can create life by just speaking the word. He is Almighty. So in our text, God is basically reminding Abraham and Sarah and all of us that he is God. But I think he's also asking us why we keep trying to uh, make him over into our image and our likeness and make him weak and small and ineffective and unable. 
Why do we keep on doing that? And that is what we do, isn't it? I mean, isn't that the truth? Am I the only one who has ever made our God far smaller than he actually is? Am I the only one who has become convinced that God is not going to be able to help us because our problems are just too big? We've all done that, haven't we? For whenever we worry, I mean, whenever we spend hours and days stressing about our problems, well, that's a sign that we're not trusting God to be able to take care of those problems for us. Worry is a sign that we're making God way too small. So do you ever worry? Do you ever make God small in your thinking? Well, consider a few examples. Maybe we hear the news that either we or or someone we love has cancer. So what happens in our thinking as soon as we hear the word cancer? Well, almost automatically we begin to think that this is the end. And we panic. Because we fear God can't help us against cancer. Or, or we lose a job, and what does our mind go to? Immediately we begin to panic, thinking that we're never going to be able to pay the bills, and we're never going to be able to take care of our family, and we forget that God is able to provide for us and will take care of us. Or we're asked to witness of Jesus Christ to our neighbors and to the world, and, and right away we assume, well, God could never use me to do that kind of work. I mean, I'm no good at that sort of thing, and he'd never be able to use my words. And we assume God is so small that he can't use us. Or, or someone suggests that our church take on a new ministry, and immediately we think of problems and obstacles, and, and we decide right away that there's no way God could overcome all those problems and all those obstacles. And so we might as well not even try, because we're doomed to fail, because our God is unable to help us apparently or when we're called upon to repent to actually change the way we live and and change our sinful lives we assume that that's impossible that we can never change our lives that you can't teach an old dog new tricks after all and somehow we've made God into so weak a God that he can't even change us from within be honest then a lot of times we are just like Sarah in our text. And we too make God way too small. We make God over in our image and our likeness and thus end up with a weak, small, almost pathetic God. Isn't that what we do? It's true, isn't it? All too often it's true. And that's why I want to tell you the rest of the story. For Jesus in our text said, at the appointed time I will return to you about this time next year and Sarah will have a son. So Jesus repeated the promise that had been told Abraham and Sarah for, for all those years and he told them that in less than a year God would keep that promise. And you know what? In less than a year God kept that promise. And Sarah did become pregnant and in less than a year she had a son, a son they named Isaac. Even though it was impossible, even though Sarah was long past menopause, even though Abraham was too old, Sarah became pregnant and gave birth to the son God had promised them. And God proved once again that nothing was impossible for him. And of course, the birth of Isaac is not the only time that God made the impossible happen when it comes to pregnancy. For today, Christmas in July, we're also celebrating a time when a virgin became pregnant and eventually gave birth to a son, a very special son, the long-promised Savior of the world. Now, of course, that birth was impossible, too. It just couldn't happen. I mean, Mary was a virgin. She couldn't possibly be pregnant, and yet she was. And God kept his promise and brought the Savior into the world. He brought a, another son into the world, only this time it was his son. His son who came to take our place under the law and receive the penalty that we deserve for our sin and for our doubt and for all the times when we make God so small in our thinking. 
Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary and came into our world and took all those sins upon himself and he carried them to the cross. And he died on that cross for you, for me, so that all those sins could be forgiven. And in spite of them, we could be one with God and look forward to spending eternity with him in heaven. God did the impossible for us. The virgin became with child and gave birth to a son for us. And once again, God showed that he is a capable God, an able God, a God who can even do the impossible if that's what needs to be done for his people. And as we celebrate impossible births this day, let us remember then that our God is not some small, little, pathetic God. No, our God is big and strong and almighty. Our God is able to deal with any and every problem that comes along. Our God is able to keep all his promises to us. He is the God of the manger and the God of the cross and the God of the empty tomb. And not only can God help us through any and every problem that comes along, he will help us through any and every problem that comes along. And that's the peace that we can have. That's the peace God wants to give us. For he is God Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. He's the God that can make the impossible happen. And he does so all the time for the good of his people. Our God is the God who made Sarah pregnant and the, the God who made the Virgin Mary pregnant. And he will be there for us through every problem we go through and through through every obstacle we face. So we don't have to cower in fear. We don't have to have long sleepless nights filled with worry. We don't have to let doubts keep us from living and loving and trying. For our God is able. Our God is almighty. Our God truly is big and strong. So let's trust him. Let's trust in him to keep his promises to us. Let's trust in him to get us through the problems and the challenges. Let's trust in him to use us even for the work of his kingdom. Let's not limit him any longer. Let's not make him small any longer. My friends, just let God be God. For he is the God who is able. And as our text says, nothing is too hard for him. In Christ's name, amen.